you very much, Jalal. Thank you for the invitation to speak here. So, yeah, so I'll be making some remarks about this. In this talk, I won't be confined to my own results, so it'll be something of a survey as I see it at least, and I'll sprinkle some new results that we have in throughout. Okay, so let's just start with the 2D Euler equations. So we'll be considering mostly fluids that are confined by some uh, simply in some simply connected domain. Um, they solve um, uh, this momentum equation here. They're incompressible, so this is conservation of, of mass, and they're tangent to the boundary. I think everybody here is familiar with these equations. In two dimensions, there's a sort of simplification that you can have to discuss such velocity fields. Namely, there's a scalar function C, which is called the stream function, and the velocity, it can be written as the perpendicular gradient of this stream function. So rotate the gradient counterclockwise 90 degrees. It's called the stream function because level sets of this function are streamlines of the velocity. Namely, the velocity is just tangent to the level sets of C. Okay. The fact that the velocity is tangent to the boundary is therefore just the statement that this stream function is constant on the boundary of the domain. Um, and another simplification in two dimensions is that an important quantity in fluids, the vorticity, um, is structurally much simpler than it is in 3D. So the vorticity is the curl of the velocity field. And if the three-dimensional velocity field has a two-dimensional symmetry, namely the third component is zero, and the first two depend only on x and y, then the curl is just as a, a z component, so it's pointing out of the page, and you can, the you know you can just identify it with the scalar prefactor, which is the grad perp divergence of the velocity. So the vorticity looks something like this: just you know fluids moving around, it's pointing out of the page. <clears throat> okay, um, so this quantity is important in any dimension because. As a two form, it's Lie transported. But since you can identify it with a, a scalar in two dimensions, there's an even greater simplification, which is that the transport of a scalar is just the usual transport equation. Um, and so you have this correspondence between the vorticity, this is the, the, equation, the Euler equation in vorticity form, where you recover the velocity by this non local operation on the vorticity, you invert the curl. There's a correspondence between this and just constancy of the vorticity on particle trajectories. So the vorticity is just being pushed around by the fluid flow. By the way, please interrupt me if there are any questions at any point. <clears throat> so um, there are some important conserved quantities known for the Euler equation. So the one is momentum, just the integral of the velocity over the domain. And there's the energy um, um, and casimirs, actually. So the momentum only in certain situations. So if you have, uh, like in the periodic <laughs> channel, or you have angular momentum on the disk, the, the robust ones are, are these. And the casimirs are just any function, continuous function of the vorticity um, uh, integrated over the domain is conserved in time. So in particular, LP norms of the vorticity are preserved. Um, and that's just a consequence of the fact that the vorticity is transported through the domain. And because of this, um, you can define the dynamics for all time. So it's a classical result that if you start with C1 alpha initial velocity, which is divergence free and tangent to the boundary, then there's a unique solution um, in the same space. And moreover, it enjoys some mm, bound, which degenerates quite rapidly in time. So there's this famous double exponential growth. These are classical results. Um, there are even examples in certain cases where this type of growth is attained. So that's just to say that uh, although the, the, the motion is for all time defined, things can behave very badly at infinity, um, at least if you look in topologies like C1 alpha. Okay. Um, there's another space where the Euler equation forms a dynamical system, and that's 
if you consider initial vorticity, which is just L infinity, this is a result due to Udovich in the 60s, then there's a unique weak solution in the same class. And moreover, and this is an important for understanding the long time behavior, uh, the solution depends continuously on the data and the weak star topology. So if you take a weak star limit of the data, then the solutions weak star converge. Okay, so this space, as we'll see later in the talk, is of great importance for actually understanding the picture of the flow at, 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 late, at the late stage. Okay. So we're going to be interested in uh, persistent behaviors and a natural place to start is uh, stationary states since those exist and are unchanged for all time. So if you're a smooth stationary state, then you um, satisfy this equation. The vorticity equation just has you know, dt omega plus, but you, know, you seek a solution that's independent of time. And what this means is that at least locally, um, the gradient of the vorticity and the gradient of the stream function are collinear. So the, you know, the inner product with the rotated gradient has to be zero. That means that locally there's some functional relationship between the vorticity and the stream function of, of this type. Um, and of course, globally, this need not be true. So maybe there's not a single valued function over the whole domain, which relates vorticity and stream. But at least locally, it's, it's true everywhere. And there's a large class of steady states for which it's true globally. Um, so some examples are on the periodic channel, you have uh, shear flows. So the flows which are moving down the channel and their amplitude just va varies as a function of the distance from the wall. Uh, on a disk, you have radial vortices. So it's sort of a natural generalization of the shear flow to the uh, 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 circular domains. And finally, as I said, you can, you can identify a class of steady states uh, by just declaring some functional relationship between a vorticity and stream, and then demanding that the Euler equation be satisfied, which is just the statement that indeed the stream is the vorticity of the flow. So Laplacian of C is this given function of C, and on the boundary it's zero, so the velocity is tangent. Then uh, as long as you can solve this problem, you've identified a stationary state. Now, in general, this is not a good equation in the sense that there can be no solutions, infinitely many solutions, or a unique solution. Uh, a good example of that is you could just consider f to be an affine function, and this is just the eigenvalue problem. Um, so, uh, yeah. <clears throat> but there, there is a wide class of functions f for which there is a unique solution. I'll discuss them in a second. But the first question I, I'd like to ask sort of in passing is, when do the stationary states inherit the symmetries of the domain if they have them? Okay, so, you know, in, in these two examples that I gave, sort of a leading examples because uh, both of them have the same Euclidean symmetry as the domain. In this case, dx is a killing vector field that, you know, is tangent to the boundary on the periodic channel. And here, d theta is, is the same. Um, so, and both these flows have that same structure. So is this a general property? Is it always true that, I mean, not always, but is, for a large class of stationary states, is it true that um, they have to obey the same symmetries? Okay. So this, this turns out to be true for um, a, a very, you know, widely studied class of stationary states. This is a well-known fact. So these stationary states, which will come up a couple of times throughout the, the talk, are called Arnold stable. They are those which have a globally defined relationship between the vorticity and the stream function, like I said. But moreover, this relationship, this F, has the property that um, its derivative is could be negative, but bigger than minus the first eigenvalue of Laplacian. Um, <laughs> And if it's, and it could be anything if it's positive. So just monotone, but if it's negative, it has to be bigger than minus the first eigenvalue of Laplacian. These are sort of two cases of Arnold stability. 
and they correspond to whether or not the stationary state is a maximizer or a minimizer of the energy um, on isovortical sheets. So uh, isovortical sheet is just all the velocity fields whose vorticity is related to a, the stationary state's vorticity by some volume preserving diffeomorphism. So you sort of, you constrain your variations there and if you're a maximizer or a minimizer, then you satisfy either this or this. Okay. And of course, they're called stable because Arnold showed that um, if a steady state has this property, then it's the up and off stable in the L2 topology of vorticity. Okay. And a, and a well-known result about these is that, in fact, they do inherit the symmetries of the, the domain. So it's um, it's stated in a recent paper by myself, Dan Ginsburg, and Peter Constantine, but I think it's well known, and it's quite general. So if you just have some mm, Ramanian manifold, some metric on it, and you have a killing field that's tangent to the boundary, if it has a boundary, then any Arnold stable state it has to be symmetric with respect to that killing field. So examples are on the periodic channel, the killing field that's tangent to the boundary is dx, not dy. Both are Euclidean symmetries, but the boundary breaks dy. And you have um, shears on the disk, you have circular flows. On spherical caps, you have these zonal flows. And on the torus, there are none. So there are no uh, Arnold stable uh, stationary states on the torus because you have killing field dx and dy. Um, and so you have to be symmetric with respect to both of those, and that leaves only trivial things. Okay. So th there are other results on, on symmetries that I, I'm not going to talk about here, but I just want to point them out. So there, there are results by Nadarashvili and Hamel about non-degenerate stationary states inheriting some symmetry on periodic channel and annulus. And there's uh, results by Javi and co-authors on um, symmetries inherited uh, by uh, uh, vorticity with sign. So if your stationary state has vorticity with a given sign. I just want to say two statements about um, the structure of steady states near Arnold stable ones, uh, since that's interesting from the point of view of long time behavior, you'd like to know if you start near something, what are the other steady states like? And there's this very nice result by Schofru and Schwerak in 2010, which work on which works on an annular domain around a, a given Arnold stable steady state with some maybe some other small conditions about it. In that case, they show that um, there's sort of a one to one correspondence between vorticity distribution functions and stationary states of the Euler equation. So the space of stationary states is like a graph over the vorticity distribution functions. Namely, if you take any uh, vorticity in some neighborhood and a strong topology around this given one that they study, then there exists a unique um, stationary state for Euler on its co-joint orbit. So the co-adjoint orbit is just all the volume preserving re rearrangements of that function. So in this way, they really completely understand the structure of the stationary states around a given Arnold stable one. Okay. There's also this result that I sort of alluded to before by uh, Peter, myself, and Dan Ginsberg, um, where we show that the uh, stationary Arnold stable stationary states are quite flexible in the sense that you can really wiggle them to allow them to fit other domains. And even you can sort of slide along a space of Arnold st stable states in a given domain sort of parametrically. So we have some free function that allows us to move along that manifold, if you will, of them. And we can also change the domain. But OK, so that's, that's sort of enough about the structure of the stationary states. <clears throat> So now, now I want to talk about what happens to the fluid if you start nearby a stationary state, which is sort of the next um, level of uh, complexity to understand the long time behavior. And there are some results now, classical results. The one first one being by Herbert Koch about 
nonlinear instability. And a later paper by Margulis, Schnellman, and Udovich, actually two years after Udovich passed away, um, that basically shows that in strong norms, stationary states are extremely unstable, even the Arnold stable ones, of course. So they say if you take any sufficiently smooth uh, 2D Euler steady state with the property that the Lagrangian flow map is not time periodic. So I'll say a bit more about that in a second, but Udovich calls this condition isochronal. Um, then it's nonlinearly unstable in C1 alpha, specifically, you know, uh, for any M large and epsilon small, there's some time for which the solution which started within epsilon and C1 alpha uh, leaves a ball of M in C1 alpha. So you really sort of uh, develop in a quantitative way, small scales, okay? And to prove this result, you, you exploit the shearing that the stationary state has to be doing. So the fact that the Lagrangian flow map is not time periodic, it just means if you put, you know, dye in your fluid, then, uh, at, you know, the fluid may mix it up, but it, it's not the case that at a later time, the dye comes back to itself, okay? So all the orbits don't have the same period. And if they don't all have the same period, that means, you know, you can be in a region where nearby orbits have slightly differing periods and that creates a shearing. So particles on nearby orbits, their distance between them will grow in time. Okay. And just exploring. Yeah, I have a question yeah. here, but in this case, sure. you are L2 stable. Yes. Yes. You're L2 stable. Uh, that's... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. So this is really a statement about roughening of the solution nearby mm -hmm. so, yeah okay right um right so this is the isochronal thing you just imagine these these arrows are made up of of particles at some later time they may wiggle later time they may wiggle but isochronal ones will always come back to their original configuration at some final time and as long as the steady state doesn't satisfy this property then you know instability in these stronger norms Udovich actually wrote. When you talk about instability, can you ask? Yeah, yeah. So when you say instability, so the C1 alpha doesn't blow up, it just grows. Right, that's right. But I'll talk about blow up results in a second. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. So because, you know, it's instability in the sense that you measure it to the C1 alpha norm without renormalizing. That's kind of like the issue. That's right. But just in one second, I'll, I'll discuss some infinite time blow up results for C1 alpha. So just to say that this class of vortices, I mean, these isochronal ones is not empty. Um, Udovich gave an example in one of his early papers of um, an elliptical vortex with just constant vorticity. So it occupies an elliptical domain. It has constant vorticity inside. The stream function is this one. Um, and it has this property that it's isochronal. Now, for this particular example of an isochronal flow, uh, you can easily perturb it to get a non-isochronal steady state nearby, and therefore it is still non-linearly unstable by the same theorem. But we don't know in general how isochronal flows look. Um, Udovich conjectured in that paper where he introduced it um, that this should be unique, at least in the class of constant vorticity um, flows on simply connected domains. And indeed that's that's true. So in some work with Tarek, we, we showed um, that these elliptical vortices are sort of the unique ones with constant vorticity. But uh, if you have non-constant vorticity, it's, it's not clear what kind of structure you would have to have to maintain isochronality. It's not clear if they exist or, or not. Okay, so. So, okay, so this is to, to Alex's question. So this is now about um, infinite time blow up. So the first, result that I know about this was by um, Narashvili in, in the 90s. So the setting is, and he stated it as a, as a, um, a wandering result, which is, but, but I'll, I'll state it like that, but then explain how it's related to infinite time blow up. So his setting is you have a, a periodic channel um, and his statement is there exists some divergence free field C, small number epsilon, large number T, such that for any velocity in a neighborhood of C, uh, you, you leave that neighborhood 
uh, after some time for all later times. So you, you never re-enter that neighborhood. So in a way, it's sort of a non-ergodicity result for the dynamics in C1-alpha. And that's how he uh, sort of stated it. But actually, his proof gives much more. His proof actually shows that you know the, the C1-alpha norm of the solution starting nearby C grows indefinitely in time. Uh, in fact, like T to the alpha. And the idea is simple. So his C is uh, a perturbation of coet flow. I'm, I'm stating it actually on the channel. He did it on the annulus, but it's the same. So imagine you just have constant vorticity coet flow and you perturb it with some very small amount of vorticity that just connects the top and the bottom pieces of the channel and uh, the width is very thin. Okay, so th that's actually the C he chose. Um, but we can actually just think of uh, this as being uh, something that's going to evolve and see what happens. So because coet flow on the channel is stable, in fact, in L infinity, so it's, 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 even, it's actually not technically Arnold stable, but it is stable in a stronger space than Arnold stable solutions. Um, because it's stable in L infinity, and this is a small perturbation, you know that the velocity, which was say one up here and zero down here, is going to stay you know, one plus or minus epsilon up here and zero plus or minus epsilon down here for all time, right? Because L, in L infinity stability of velocity, I mean, vorticity implies a velocity. So in particular, you can, you can say that the top particle on this wall, which is confined to that wall, it can never move, and the bottom particle here are going to, you know, have some distance growing between them. This one's going to be going at speed essentially one, this one at speed essentially zero. So this string connecting them will necessarily wrap its way around this uh, periodic channel. Okay. Now, because the area also has to be preserved by the dynamics, you know that if it's growing in length like T, which is the relative velocity, then it has to be shrinking somewhere like one over T. And in fact, that's exactly how, um, you know, he can, he can establish this growth, indefinite growth of the C1 alpha, okay? So this is an example of singularity formation at infinite time. And there have been many such examples since then. Uh, I'd like to point out the one by Kiselev and Schwerak that was actually exhibiting the sharpness of the double exponential growth on, on disk domain, but there are works by Denisov, Zhilatosh, and uh, Elgindi and uh, Zhang uh, also studying similar phenomena. Okay. So Yudovich um, conjectured that this type of behavior should be gen generic. Um, in fact, he, the way he said it is a substantial set of inviscid and compressible flows whose vorticity gradients grow without bound. There should be substantial, and at least it should be dense enough to provide loss of smoothness or an arbitrary disturbance of every steady flow, he says. Um, so it's a reasonable, I mean, if you've ever looked at simulations of 2D fluids, it's a, quite a reasonable conjecture. Um, but, okay, so here's some small step uh, towards this, it's uh, certainly not as general as Yudovich uh, uh, asserts, but w here we say just if you have um, if you have an L this is work with Tarek in preparation. So if you have an L2 stable stationary state with a vorticity that has an isolated minimum or a maximum, so for example like a strictly convex shear on the periodic channel or a radially decreasing vortex on the disk. Um, then there's some small uh, neighborhood of that steady state such that um, the set of initial vorticities in that neighborhood, which blow up like T to the alpha, we, we lose a little bit in C alpha, um, is dense. So, uh, so in fact, really um, neighborhoods of these types of steady states really do become rough at infinity generically. Um, and in fact, you can say that for any Arnold stable flow, or actually more generally, any flow with a functional relationship between vorticity and stream, uh, which is bigger, you know, at where it's monotone and 
bigger than minus the first eigenvalue of Laplacian. A similar statement is true, but maybe not for the whole neighborhood, but instead a neighborhood within the neighborhood. So you can sort of approximate any such flow by things of the type we study. And so this is saying that, yeah, really, really fluids do, uh, two dimensional fluids do really become rough at infinity, at least in this context. And the idea of the proof is to exploit a, a form of Lagrangian stability that such um, steady states have. So the, uh, the idea is that because the vorticity is transported and because they are L2 stable, um, if they have this isolated maximum or minimum, these vortex lines can't really leave very far the area that they start. Otherwise, they would end up violating the L2 stability. And what that tells you is that the, um, the Lagrangian trajectories themselves are stable in a certain sense. So they can't leave sort of in, in angle action coordinates. You can think of defining radial variable by the value of the stream and uh, angular variable along as measuring the distance along a given streamline. And the radial variable is really for all time confined if you start in this region close to the max or min. And the angular variable acts like the shearing on the channel. You, you're, there's really some relative uh, difference that's maintained for all time. So you can, you can confine it. And so uh, these, together with some sort of elementary analysis of the vorticity gives you, like in the Nadarashvili result, infinite time growth. But then if you apply all, also the Koch statement about the nonlinear instability, uh, because the flow map is actually going to infinity, uh, the gradient of the flow map is going to infinity in, an, in a whole neighborhood, you can show that it implies this generic statement. Okay, and so here's just a picture of what something like this might look like. The steady state is, mm, it, now this is on periodic box, so it's not actually nonlinearly stable, but it, it is stable if you maintain certain odd, odd symmetry. And so here's a perturbation of it. And you see that what happens is just that these things uh, spin around and, and filament, and over time it just continues to do this. And it, it's exactly this type of filamentation, which is captured here. So the growth is exactly of this type. Excuse me, uh, can I yeah. ask you, so, uh, this theorem, is it true also at the linearized levels? If you just look at the linearized equation, do you get the same theorem? Yeah, so at the linearized equation- Without the D to the- Yeah, no, yeah, you, you get the right rate for the linear, the linear equation. For the you linearized theorem, the, so for the linearized equation, you get the, the right, it's the right it's the, the, if you think of the quid flow, that's how it works. Exactly. Uh, so this whole thing is a linearized. It basically all comes from the, the instability that you are talking about comes from the, from the instability of the linearized flow is measured relative to C1 or C alpha. Yeah, it, it, exactly. I mean, the only, the only okay. point is that it persists nonlinearly for all time. So it persists nonlinearly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so in the remaining part of the talk, I, I want to sort of describe some aspects of what the asymptotic picture is of the flow at long times. And th this part of the talk will primarily have to do with other people's work, but I think it's very interesting. So um, anyway, so, right. So here's the vorticity equation uh, again. And as we know, there's this conservation law, which is that uh, L infinity, in fact, any LP norm is just conserved. Um, and therefore, you have weak star limits at long times. So uh, vorticity on se sequences of times converges weak star to some limits. They need not be unique. Um, and a natural object to consider from the point of view of the long time dynamics is the omega limit set of a given initial data. So this is just the collection of all weak star limits as you take time to infinity on the orbit, on the Euler orbit. And the goal is to try to understand what you can about the structure of this omega limit set. So there are some immediate uh, things you can say. First, 
the kinetic energy is weak star continuous. So if you um, weak, weak, weakly converge to something, its energy converges. So you can't change the energy of the initial condition that you start on. I would say that, therefore, the energy is a robust invariant. You, you remember it at infinite time, even though, uh, well, okay, you remember it at infinite time. On the other hand, the, the casimirs, which are you know, continuous functions of vorticity, if, if f is not an affine function, then the casimirs are not weak star continuous. So in general, you cannot expect the long time limit of the Casimir on the orbit to agree with the long time limit, uh, sorry, to agree with the Casimir on the long time limit. But if F is uh, convex, you have an inequality. So you know that you can only lose convex function at infinity. So you know, if you have a given, say, entropy, L2 norm of vorticity, initially, then the weak limits, whatever they are, can only have lesser or equal entropy. And the mechanism for this is clear. Uh, it's, it's mixing. So, so you have some spot of dye here, and here's a rod that's going to stir it up. You see that over time, it develops um, you know, finer and finer filaments, which get ever closer. And there's some self-averaging that happens. And in that self-averaging, you lose some information about the vorticity. And in doing so, you can decrease things like this. Okay. So, there's a conjecture that I think can be attributed to Schwerak, which is that generically um, orbits of 2D Euler are not precompact, which means that generically somewhere in the flow, uh, precompact in L2. So generically somewhere in the flow, some mixing should take place, and the weak limits as, as you take time to infinity should, should actually lose with a strict inequality some of this uh, entropy or any other convex function of the vorticity. So it's really saying generically some mixing should happen. Okay. And I'll, I'll come back to this conjecture a bit later. So, so now let's just try to make some, you know, naive conjectures about what the flow might look like at infinity. Um, the first one perhaps is that maybe you say Euler is the most efficient mixer it can be, and therefore perhaps the long time limit is just replacing the vorticity by its average over the domain. Everything gets mixed up uniformly, as might happen in a picture like this. Right? Okay. In which case the omega limit set would just be uh, that average. But this is impossible, at least in some situations. Consider the case of the torus then you have to take uh, average of the vorticity zero if it's to be periodic, it's the perpendicular gradient. Uh, and so uh, this number here would be zero, but you know that the energy is conserved on the weak limit and the energy was not zero. So in particular, this is impossible. Okay, so the, the first naive conjecture can be sort of immediately ruled out. Then you say, okay, well, I didn't account for the energy as a robust invariant, so maybe instead what happens is Euler minimizes the entropy subject to the constraint that it doesn't change the energy. Okay, so then you have this functional I of omega and the energy E of omega, and you just uh, minimize this, adding the energy as a Lagrange multiplier, could be some number. And if you perform that variational calculation, you find that the minimizers satisfy this equation where um, this number here, minus lambda one, is just the first eigenvalue of the Laplacian on, on the domain. So the prediction, according to this conjecture, is that the long time behavior will look like the first eigenvalue of, of Laplacian on the domain, which is, of course, a stationary Euler state. Okay, And in fact, it's, it's like a large scale vortex, right? Because the, the first eigenfunctions kind of occupy the domain at the largest scale available and the disk, they're radial and yeah. Um, and this has some, I mean, this, this has some, uh, um, this looks kind of reasonable. First of all, there's this inverse energy cascade mechanism, which is 
uh, present in two-dimensional fluids because of the constraints imposed by entropy conservation um, and energy conservation. It just says that uh, what you expect to happen is that if you have small scale features in the flow, they sort of conglomerate over time. And in the end, you see something that's large scale. This is from a, a real experiment. And so the fact that at the end state, you predict this large scale structure kind of jives with that. But there are you know, questions you can ask. I mean, for example, why did you choose the quadratic F to minimize. I mean, any convex function would have done just as well, and then this would change. So, I mean, what's so special about the entropy? And so, in, in the physics literature, this conjecture, I mean, this is called um, selective decay theory because you're selecting a particular Casimir to say is the one that's minimized, and you get your prediction based on that. And there is some evidence for this um, as being uh, the long time behavior of slightly viscous flows. Where you renormalize, so it doesn't, you know, you real, you know, everything's going to zero in that case, but you renormalize, and the long time limits. There's some evidence that they look like this, but for inviscid flows, uh, not so, as we'll see. So because this is, I mean, obviously a, a, a very delicate problem, and we're kind of lost. There's no shame at looking at numerical simulations. So here, let's just start 2D Euler with um, some random data, Gaussian random data at a given characteristic scale, which is much smaller than the size of the periodic box, the periodic simulation. Then over time, you see that the vortices do tend to conglomerate, as we saw in that experimental picture. Um, and at very late stages, it seems like you converge to something like a vortex dipole, dipole that just wanders around the domain and some satellite vortices are orbiting them and it's not clear whether or not these orbits will decay and fall in or they will persist forever, not clear, um, right? <clears throat> but I, I don't want to give the impression, oh, I guess one, yeah, so I don't want to give the impression that this is the only thing that can happen. So if you start with very similar, just different realization of the same uh, Gaussian random data, then at some later stage, roughly the same time, they look roughly similar. But if you go to very long times in this simulation, what appears to happen is you uh, fall onto some uh, vortex tripole pair. So these are spinning in uh, opposite directions and they themselves are moving like a dipole. So, so maybe you know, this is not the only behavior you can see. There, are, There's potentially a whole zoo of other persistent behaviors that may survive at, at long time. The one point here is that on the torus, at least, you don't seem to go to something stationary at all. I mean, it's something that persists uh, with time dependence forever. So the predictions of the selective decay theory that you go to something static is perhaps not appropriate in this setting. So just some pictures. I mean, you know, these coherent structures exist in nature. They're not described by 2D Euler, but okay. You know, there's these, you know, for example, the classic red spot on Jupiter is a very long lived uh, persistent vortex. In fact, I think it was first observed by Galileo um, in the 1600s. So it's lived at least 365 years. Um, so, you know, roughly speaking, we want to understand these types of structures, but in a very simple model. And so there's this apparent mystery, which is, um, you know, you start with essentially any initial data, you know, Gaussian random data, any initial data. And over time, things start to look, well, uh, simpler. I mean, maybe two vortices, maybe vortex tripoles, but some maybe small collection of vortices that wander around the domain, much simpler than, than this, or rather than you know, any point at arbitrary in, in the phase space. So you can think of this reduction in complexity as somehow a, a decrease of entropy, where here I really just mean like uh, some measure of diversity in the phase space. Lots of things are going to a small group of things. And um, 
how do you how do you explain this entropy decrease in a time reversible system like Euler? So that's that's sort of the the mystery. Um, and I just wanted to make this sort of uh, caveat, which is that this entropy decrease is actually vis visually apparent here in the sort of phase portrait of the velocity or the vorticity, but it could be that you know there's a, a flip side of this picture, which is if you look at the Lagrangian flow maps or particle trajectories, there perhaps you'll see you know an ever increasing amount of complexity. And so there could be some sort of trade-off between these. And I just want to point out to this paper of Schnerelman in the 90s where he exhibits a Lyapunov uh, function for the vorticity dynamics, but it's, uh, it's, it's in the Lagrangian picture. So Lyapunov function is some mm, indication of irreversibility, and it, indeed there, there is such a thing, but you, you have to really look at the trajectories to see it. Um, okay. So the remaining, whatever, talk will be about some aspects of this. Uh, was there a question or no? So the, uh, at least in the physics literature that I'm aware of, I think the first attempts to understand these issues were by Lars Ansager. Um, and his quote is that the formation of large isolated vortices is an extremely common yet spectacular phenomenon in unsteady flow. Its ubiquity selects, suggests an explanation on statistical grounds. So let me note that this paper is the same one that he discusses the mm, energy dissipation anomaly in three-dimensional flows. So the beginning part of the paper, that was the end. Um, and he, he considered a reduction of the problem he made the problem finite dimensional by uh, uh, thinking about point vortices. So Ansaga said, let's pretend, the vort let's suppose the vorticity is um, just a, po a collection of positively and negatively signed uh, point vortices spinning, of course, in opposite directions. Um, and he considered more general than this, but we can take them the same number. And let's just call this row plus and row minus. Then he said, okay, now the, the point vortex dynamics is A, finite dimensional, and B has a conserved energy. The, the formal kinetic energy is infinite. U square is infinite for a point vortex, but you could think of a renormalization of it as just the integral of the stream against vorticity, which is finite. And that is uh, preserved by the motion of the point vortex system. So just like 2D Euler, there is a conserved quantity. And that conserved quantity sort of foliates the phase space. So uh, the point vortices, vortices are sort of wandering around these energy surfaces. And Ansager said, OK, suppose that the dynamics are really ergodic on those energy surfaces. And following sort of equilibrium statistical mechanics ideas that they maximize the available phase, like the state spends time um, maximizing the available phase space subject to its constraint, which is that they maximize some Boltzmann type entropy that counts the degrees of freedom. Um, and he just then considered maximizing this functional, which he just asserted, um, subject to the constraint of the energy being what it is, and also the circulation, so the positive and negative vorticity circulations being preserved. So it's a constrained variational problem. And he predicted that the end state would look like uh, the solution of this equation. So it's in particular some function functional of the stream function here. So if, if this equation has solution, then it is a stationary state of Euler. Um, and these numbers, beta, mu plus, mu minus, are just the Lagrange multipliers to ensure that the energy is what it is initially and the circulation and, and so on is what it is. Um, so this is a, a non-local equation, in fact, because these are determined non-locally. And this beta is, by analogy with statistical mechanics, can be identified as the inverse temperature. And the the behavior of this is that if beta is negative, you tend to see a conglomeration of like sign vortices. So there's mm, uh, you know localized vortices, blue and red, in 
described by the stream function. So he termed these negative temperature states for that reason, like sine vortices statistically attract. Okay, they shouldn't, you know, dynamically attract, but they statistically attract. So this was the first attempt as an equilibrium theory to understand the, the long time behavior. And he says, right, so he says that if this, this is beta, is negative, then vortices of the same sign tend to cluster, preferably the strongest ones, so as to use up the excess energy at the least possible cost in terms of degrees of freedom. It stands to reason that the large compound vortices form in this manner will remain the only conspicuous features of the motion because weaker vortices are free to roam practically at random. So it's it's remarkable to me that before looking at any of these simulations, Ansager sort of, like like all of his conjectures, gets it kind of spot on if you if you look at these videos i mean it's exactly how i would describe in words what's happening here and he did it just uh, yeah okay and i'm not going to say that i can sh share these notes uh, but um he wrote some letters to colleagues explaining his theory and they're quite quite beautiful so if you want to read them they're here Okay, but this general approach, which goes under the name of statistical hydrodynamics, um, has some issues. And let me first mention that there, there was a lot of work on this. So Miller, Robert, Whiteman, Cross, Samaria, so all people who have worked on this in various contexts. Um, and the, the general scheme is, is always the same. The first is you want to understand the infinite dimensional fluid so you, but what, what the first step is to replace that infinite dimensional phase space by some finite dimensional approximation. So Ansager chose point vortices, but you could do other things like Galerkin approximation, for example. The crucial point is that for your finite dimensional dynamics, you want, um, first of all, to approximate the infinite dimensional one as you send n to infinity, but also you want it to maintain a certain energy an energy conservation, so the point vortices had it, Galerkin has it. You want it to maintain that invariant. And you also want the dynamics to have a Louisville theorem, so phase space volume should be conserved, since that's um, almost a prerequisite for ergodicity, which is something that all these theories appeal to in the end. Okay, and, and both of these things have that property. They have this Louisville theorem. Um, and then, there's some assertion that uh, um, you have this, okay, surface of constant energy now, the dynamics are constrained to that. And the prediction is that it spends most of its time around a stationary state, which is selected by maximizing the entropy subject to all the constraints. This is sort of a, a result of the ergodic hypothesis and statistical mechanics ideas. Now, aside from actually justifying why this should be the case, there are, there are a couple of issues even applying the general um, framework. First, of course, I, I forgot to mention that all of these things are considered in first the limit as long time and then take the degrees of freedom to infinity. So make n go to infinity. So Ansager's predictions are supposed to hold when the number of point vortices gets very large but you sort of consider infinite time first because you want to appeal to the, the properties of the finite dimensional ergodic dynamics. That's, that's the idea. And you, to, to apply to real fluid, you want to transpose these limits. And maybe it works in some systems that are near equilibrium, but fluid is quite far from equilibrium. And there are a number of results that sort of point to that the existence of the Lyapunov functional by Schnurlman, the, the wandering by Narashvili, even for the point vortex system, Kahnen proved that there's integrable motion for n vortices, so it's not, cannot be really ergodic. Um, and moreover, and maybe more importantly, the, the infinite dimensional fluid is open in a certain sense. So the vortices are confined both to a finite region of space and also the energy is, is I mean, the the vorticity is, 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 is constant. So you have a finite dimensional phase space to work around in, but um, the infinite dimensional fluid is open in a certain sense. So first you have this mixing phenomenon where you can actually lose entropy at infinity, which means you're, you're, you're losing things to infinite fr frequency. 
So you, you can lose information at infinite frequency. And this in fact happens, it goes back to the you know, sort of seminal work of Jacob and, and Masmuri. Um, and also the configuration space is unbounded because now for the fluid, the configuration space is actually the uh, flow map, the particle trajectories. And the diameter of the group of volume preserving diffeomorphisms where these flow maps are wandering around is infinite in two dimensions. So there's a certain sense in which both the velocity space and the configuration space are, unbound, are, are open or, or unbounded. Okay. So, okay, uh, unfortunately I don't have that much time, but I, I want to say just maybe two more things. Uh, Schnurlman has a, a theory that uh, in, embraces the openness in the, the, from in the, in the uh, frequency. So embraces mixing. Um, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Basically the, the idea is that mm, he introduces a class of mixing operators, K, which have the property that they are uh, non-negative and they integrate to one in both variables. So they're sort of bi-stochastic operators. And he says that uh, something is a mixing of F, for example, if it's K applied to F, sort of mixing its values. So two examples of Ks are pinning to a certain volume preserving diffeomorphism. This is in fact what happens at finite time for Euler. That's a perfectly reasonable K and also one. So, so well, first of all, pinning just means that this uh, object is just F at this point. And if you replace by one, then this is just a pure mixing of Fs. So it's like a pure mixing operator and this one doesn't really do any mixing at all. It just evaluates it. And Schnellman shows that this space of all these mixing operators is convex, weakly compact, semi-group of contractions in L2. So you can only lose and you can only lose L2 norm if you're if you are mixing. And he defines a partial order on functions, scalar functions. He just says F is less than G if it's a mixing of G and they're equivalent if you know F is a mixing of G and G is a mixing of F. Okay. This partial order on scalar functions induces an order on uh, divergence-free velocities just by demanding the order on the curls. Okay. And then he considers the set of uh, velocities, which are mixings of a given u zeros, subject to the fact that they have the same energy. Okay, so this is a reasonable set to consider because it it um, it contains the orbit of the Euler solution for all time. So, at finite times, um, the vorticity is just a volume-preserving rearrangement of its initial data. So this is clearly true. And at infinite times, it's also true that there's a mixing operator that always describes the behavior and you preserve energy for all time. Okay, so the Euler path lives somewhere in this set given an initial data. And what, what uh, and then what Schnellman considers is the minimal elements in this set, namely um, the elements uh, such that um, for all things that are, are mixings of it, they're, they're equivalent. So it's like the maximally mixed element in this set. And his, his main result is that, uh, first of all, minimal elements always exist. Uh, so any initial vorticity, say bounded vorticity, uh, there's a minimal element in that set. And the minimal elements are stationary solutions of the Euler equations that are moreover Arnold stable or almost Arnold stable. And he divides them into types. So energy excessive, energy neutral, and energy deficient. Energy excessive being any mixing of it would lessen the energy. So they have the most energy possible relative to mixings. Um, neutral doesn't change energy and energy deficient, you can only lose energy. Okay, so what this is saying is that um, if Euler is really maximally mixing and he doesn't choose any metric for that, like he doesn't say minimize entropy or or, or a different Casimir, it's just being property of just being a minimal element, then the prediction is the long time limits are stable stationary states of Euler. In fact, Arnold stable. Um, okay. There, there is, uh, uh, with Michele Dolce, um, there's, there's a reinterpretation of, of, of some of what Schnurman does as a, as a variational uh, problem. But I, I'm, I unfortunately I have to skip that. 
But let me just say that, unfortunately, as we saw in the simulations, it doesn't appear that long time limits are stationary, at least in the case of the torus. And this is a, a point that Schnurlman, in fact, mentioned in, in a later work, where, where he just points out that things tend to not become stationary, but rather time dependent, periodic, quasi periodic, perhaps even chaotic. And it's some indication that Euler is really not a completely effective mixer. Some solutions can be sort of trapped in these time dependent regimes. And he issued this conjecture, which I think is quite a, a beautiful one. Um, okay, so it says that the space of L2 compact under the Euler evolution orbits of vorticity is actually the weak star attractor of the Euler dynamics. So, so what does it mean? He, so he's saying that, okay, maybe you don't go to a stationary state, but stationary state has a property that if you start Euler with that data, it just stays there. So in particular, the orbit is L2 compact. Um, and what's observed is that things go to regular, quite regular solutions, so periodic, quasi-periodic, and things like that. All of those periodic orbits come back to their initial configuration after some period of time. And so therefore the orbit is also pre-compact. It doesn't experience any mixing at infinity. And so the assertion is that the, the, the things that Euler can mix to get to uh, are those that they themselves do not mix under the Euler evolution. Um, okay, so there are just two remarks about this I'd like to make. First of all, the space of compact orbits for Euler is at least not everything. So there's the work of Jacob and Masmoudi and also Alex and Howe uh, showing in, related to inviscid damping, which show that indeed there's, uh, you know, many initial conditions that do experience mixing or loss of compactness for Euler. So, so this is not everything. And one uh, point in, in favor of this conjecture is that for any initial vorticity, which is bounded, there's always something in its omega limit set which has the property that it's a pre-compact orbit for Euler. So this is proved in lecture notes of Schwerk. So Schnurlman's conjecture is just that everything in the omega limit set is in fact a pre-compact orbit for Euler. So this is my last slide. Um, I, I'd like to, to mention again the conjecture of Schwerk that generic orbits of Euler do mix, so they are not pre-compact. And the conjecture of Schnurman I just mentioned that says that the omega limits that consist of pre-compact orbits, these two together are in a way, if they were established, an explanation of this mystery of decrease uh, of entropy at long time for Euler. It's saying that everything tends to a far less diverse set, which is just defined by pre-compact orbits. Uh, most points in the phase space do not have that property. Um, and Spiritually, these, except for the generic statement, uh, which has to do with this L infinity, spiritually, these are, are true in a neighborhood of Coed, and I should mention also Alex and Howe's work. Um, uh, their inviscid damping results near certain stationary states, like monotone shear flows on the channel, um, have the property that in a ball in a certain topology, Gervais topology, everything either loses compactness or it's itself a steady state. And in fact, you can say much more. You can identify uh, the long time limits as certain modified shears, but it exhibits exactly this phenomenon of um, decreasing the diversity of the phase space at long time limit. Um, yeah, so that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Theo. Uh, first, let me check. Are there any questions? I have a question because I don't really understand the conjecture of Schneerman, maybe. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds to me like he's saying that the, the omega limit set can be any stationary solution. Uh, well, no, he's saying that the omega limit sets comprise of... Um, points in the phase space with the property that the Euler evolution is pre-compact in L2. So he's not, he's not asserting which pre-compact orbits can arise as long time limits. Um, he's just saying that, you know, all of those long time limits should have that property. Okay. Any stationary solution in fact does have that property, 
And it is its own but, Omega limit set. Right, but we don't know. We don't know what solutions have. No, this we don't. This, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it by itself it is very difficult to say what kind of orbits have this property. But again, that's why I mean they are conjectures after all. But mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. why if you pair these, it, it gives some qualitative understanding of this entropy decrease. Okay. Uh, any questions? Please go ahead and ask if you have, because I can't see anyone on my. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do you have uh, so um, related to this basic conjecture of uh, like the the fact that uh, you have a weak convergence of omega of t as t goes to infinity? Do you yeah. have any other? Uh, so this has been this has been proved by the asymptotic stability, but are there any other ways? Is, is there any other mechanism by which it's been proved? Yeah, that's a great question. None that I know of. I mean, uh, of course, the, the asymptotic stability results establish much more. You prove and much so you, more, exactly. Just to prove that, you prove much more. Yeah. So, uh, the, yeah. The mechanism you... I don't, it would be great if there was some software argument to establish it. I, I don't know of any. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Any further questions? If no one has the question, thanks to you again for fantastic lecture, and we hope to see Thank you, you next week. We'll send an announcement you. soon. Thanks, Theo. Thanks, everyone. And Bye, everybody. Thanks, Theo. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. Thank you.